Hey, have you heard of this book called The Untethered Soul? I have. I haven't read it. Um, but it sounds like a, a soul that is unbound. Untethered. Unbound. What is bound short for? Well, bound two things now. Boundaries. So a soul without boundaries. Unlimited comes to mind. Infinite comes to mind. Infinite soul with no boundaries. The untethered soul. But when I first heard of this kind of a... Because it came, because I wasn't even think That wasn't the first thing that came to me was the untethered soul. It was the bound soul. I was like meditating on that phrase, the bound soul. The devils that bedevil me, are they bound? Because it's like binding. They're bounded. They're fenced in. What are they fenced in? Bound. They were like, you know, I don't know. They're pretty much just telling me they use magic. Electronic magic, computer magic, whatever it is. But, you know, electronically, what are they doing? The same thing that they would do in the mythology of witchcraft. Binding spells. What does a binder? Well, when Donald Trump was first elected and there was a lot of um, liberals that didn't like him, a lot of those people claimed they were witches and they were going to put binding spells on Donald Trump so he couldn't do what he wanted to do. Did it happen? Well, he was going to drain the swamp. Do you think that all those witches were working for the people of the USA or were they working for, I don't know, the 1%? Because all those witches went to work on Donald Trump and he didn't drain the swamp. Because those witches bound him with lots of spells, according to someone looking at it from a witchy perspective. And to this day, I don't know, the QAnon, and, um, I don't know, we haven't seen any of this QAnon army that we thought might pop up by now. So, I don't know. I mean, really, is it? like I don't know. Anyways, an untethered soul is unbound. In other words, there's no binding spells on it, whether they're, you know, like what? Witchy? Well, I don't know. How do you remove other people's spells on you? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. I haven't had formal training in witchcraft. I mean, I don't know. It seems to be presented to me quite often, but... You know, I just, I don't, I don't, I haven't read a lot of books on witchcraft, Do I have, I, I did buy, um, I don't know, some things in, in, you know, well, it's just that once, you know, Rumpelstiltskin came, I, I don't know, he wasn't much on reading. And then when Brent Beeson came, Brent Beeson and King Clancy came, they don't even know how to read. So they don't like reading. They don't. They, they find it embarrassing. Who are King Clancy and Brent Beeson? They're devils. Real, yes, absolutely real, absolutely. Hannibal Lecter, you would put them in the cell next to Hannibal Lecter. Both of those people, absolutely, they're the same quality. Absolutely murderous terrorist, yes. If you want to know King Clancy, he's a murderous terrorist. For police people out there, it's John Doe. Because I don't know his real human name. But there are, um, I think there are, well, I don't know, quite a lot Quite a lot. It's what? It's a conspiracy to commit terrorism and murder. Um, and yeah, multiple coins. Like, seriously, do you think that with, I can't help you out? I can't help you out. You're going to tell me this isn't terrorism, what they're doing to me by remote control? Well, they are. And you can see they do it every day. So, you know, it's just simply going to be, uh, I don't know, one of them says without compunction. In other words, they don't think they're going to get caught. It's been like a long time. Anyways, what do we think is going to happen? Well, again and again and again and again and again and again and again. What we intend to happen is more important than what we think is going to happen. Because it empowers you to say, who the fuck knows what people think? Who the fuck cares what people think? People are stupid. and Everybody's going to clap and say, that's the one thing you said that I agree with. People are stupid. So, who cares what they think? My intention is clear. That's the peace symbol from the, you know, way back in the 1970s. The peace symbol. That's what I intend, and that's why I wear this shirt.
I intend peace. I am the change that I want to see. I wear a shirt. And then I don't act like anybody else, do I? I don't. I don't follow the herd. I don't. What do I follow? Well, I don't know. A lot of times I get tired around by devils that insist that I do this or that for them. Tim Clancy and Brent Beeson, Eve the Rat, Rumpelstiltskin, Mrs. Pindar. I don't know. Hope I'm more. Well, what are they? Well, there's a band of, I don't know, humans on the planet that have got high-tech machines that create Monsters, Inc. You know that movie? Well, you know, it's an animated movie, kind of? Yeah, well, I don't know. They use a virtual reality, and they impose the virtual reality on me. It's very high-tech. It's military technology designed for torturing people, I don't know, vast numbers of people and keeping them in the dark as to what's exactly going on. The first year that I had Rumpelstiltskin torturing me from the inside out, um, well, he never, he never said anything other than he was Rumpelstiltskin, the mythological character. And he certainly has the most vicious, vicious, horrid nature, just like Rumpelstiltskin from Disney's Once Upon a Time. Ergo, it's a Disney product. The virtual reality thing that's imposed on me, I'm not wearing an Oculus, and I don't have an emitter here in my room. Nothing. There's no hardware here. It's being done, it's being beamed at me by high, high, high tech. Walt Disney Corporation is clearly in, I don't know, everybody knows about Club 33, everybody knows the ties to, I don't know, Freemasonry. Nobody understands anything about Freemasonry other than it's a secret society. And no one wants to tell you about the Masonic architecture of Washington, D.C. You can go and Google all those things and then you can come back to me later. Does it mean it's a... Fr I don't know, because even, you know, the pictures of the people supposedly landing on the moon are full of Freemason symbology. And Google, the company itself, has got Masonic symbology. Google Mail looks like... Uh, it's like um, an apron that some of those Freemasons wear. And the, the apron of the Freemasons is the same as the symbol for mail for Gmail. Freemasonry is everywhere. The secret society is everywhere. How many times did you have to go to a wedding or something and wear a necktie? When you wear a necktie, every time you wear a necktie, what is it? It's Freemason. The necktie is a Freemason symbol that you wear. At the times when you're supposed to wear a tie. When you think it's just like it's formal attire. It's like, you know, the men's wear store. It's formal or semi-formal. No. If you wear a necktie, it means you're a slave of the Freemason secret society. That's what it means. You are enslaved to the egregore of Freemasonry. You're going to have to... I don't know. Some of you that are witchy are going to know what an egregore is. E.G. R E. I gotta do it. I gotta write it down. I gotta. Sometimes I gotta use my finger. Egregore. E G R E G R E. It's very difficult when you're under demonic attack to do that. But I guess I got it out. So you can Google that word. It's an important word because Freemasonry is an egregore. I don't know. It's like a school of thought forms. No, I think it's people. It's real people. Who? The people that belong to the secret? Yes. And what else? Well, they still belong to the secret society after they drop the human body. Yes, they do. Because we're learning more and more that the dropping of the human body, you know, you call it like, you know, everybody dies because we're mortal, is what? And I don't know. I don't know exactly what to tell you because it's very hard to tell you what it's a whole pile of what? Magic. It's black magic by the Freemason Secret Society and others. Well, you hear the stories. You can read about the jaguar shamans now. I don't know if they're all the same. There's lots of shamans in South America in the jungles. 
And some of the things that they do is they send darts at one another. They're not physical darts. They're thought forms of darts. And these thought forms are like a form of voodoo. The thought form of a dart entering into your enemy or somebody, you know, makes a deal and says, you're really good at throwing these mental darts at people. I need you to throw one at that person and kill them. And here I'm going to view a bunch of coconuts that I collected today. Black magic for hire. You go look it up. Anthropologists say they believe it's real. They believe it's real so much that people that are into this so-called whatever indigenous um, anthropology description of the way they live, they believe in it because for them it works. I'm a peaceful person. Shouldn't my peace out, you know, protect me from evil? Well, I was listening to a lecture by Joel S. Goldsmith of The Infinite Way. I don't know, probably 1955. The lectures are on YouTube, and should you listen to them? There's nothing better. Why? Because he denies everything else they've ever been taught. Probably most of it, anyway. Most of it. If you're a church person, he already said. He said a lot of people. I don't know. He said a lot of things in the lecture. I can't help you out. It's a demonic attack. Have I given you enough? Joel S. Goldsmith. YouTube. Pick one. Anyone. Pick any of his lectures and give it a listen. If you find it long-winded, then what you should do is, well, here, go find yourself on a couch. Get yourself a nice blankie and, you know, cozy up on the couch with your pillows and your blankie with the intention of play Joel Goldsmith in the background. Not too loud, but not too quiet. Loud enough you can hear him. And then plan to nap. Just plan to have him just, you know, droning on in the background, whatever he's going to do. And you plan on having a nap. But don't make uh, Goldsmith too loud so he's annoying. It's just like, you know, some people fall to sleep when the TV's on. At that level, you know, wherever you fall asleep with the TV on, whatever that level could be, put him there and just let him play because the lectures are long and you're planning on having a nap. Because everybody knows that when you're napping, you're relaxed and it goes right into your subconscious. And what's it going to do? It's going to help you out because it's the infinite way teaching. And all the teachings that I ever took it's one of the teachings that I keep coming back to because there's no ego in it there's no ego in the infinite way and ego is edging God out so once you get rid of edging God out. Then you have the infinite. One of the names for G-O-D. Why wouldn't you want G-O-D? I ask Clancy this all the time. King Clancy the devil. Why don't you want? Anything somehow it's going to make King Clancy no longer be King Clancy. He's going to lose himself. It's the fear of extinction in King Clancy. That's why he doesn't want to meet God. No. He knows God's here. He sees it all the time. He sees all kinds of synchronicities that, that humans couldn't put them together. It's too big of a scale, the synchronicities that, you know, he sees. Because he hangs out here torturing me. I love this itchy in my nose and in my eyes. This is all by remote control of high-tech devils, evil people like the Freemasons, but not exclusively Freemasons. There's plenty of other kinds of zillions of other devils. Some of the devils in the lower astral realm were told by David R. Hawkins of Consciousness Research. Some of the devils in hell are older than the species mankind. So, those of you people who are denying that there are things like reptilians, how are you going to explain 
devils that are in hell that are older than the species of Homo sapiens sapiens. How are you going to explain that except that we know from traditional stories about what happened that we all learned when we were kids? The reptilian empire was here on planet Earth before the rise of the mammalian. Doesn't it make sense that there are real fire-breathing dragons in hell? Because the empire of that snake, of that reptile, of that velociraptor, of that dragon... Dr. Hawkins said there are devils in hell older than the founding of our species. And they said before us it was dinosaurs. So, doesn't it make sense that dinosaurs did evolve to at least as smart as us? Wouldn't that mean that the reptoids and the reptilians quite likely are real? And the devil versions of them are some dimension close by called reptilian hell, where there's fire-breathing dragons. Well, how did they get? Well, I don't know, because they're in hell. They must have invented the idea of cooking. I don't know. Like, you know, you get a horrible, 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 horrible reptilian person, and what do you do? Well, you, you kill them and grill them, and you serve them up. I don't think the reptilians of, like, Tyrannosaurus rex were too afraid about, you know, eating other species of reptilian. Now, I'm going to throw you a hook, line, and sinker, because... What's to say that you haven't had incarnations in Earth where you were a velociraptor? In a velociraptor society? Because, I'm going to say... As a soul who is part of the Earth reincarnational cycle, you and me and the lady down the street that's putting some mail in the mailbox, it's quite likely that we have had, we are going to have, or we are having concurrent lifetimes as reptilian something or other or something. What do you call that? Fa what is it? No, it's higher than family. It's higher than order. It goes like species and then like genus and family and order. Like you could have order carnivora for dogs and wolves. I don't know. Well, it's animal kingdom, but then it's, I don't know. There's chordates, which are people that have, a, you know, the cord, the spinal cord. And, and then animals that, I guess, don't. I don't know. There's notochord, which is a primitive version of a backbone or something. And then more developed. I can't remember the details of notochord. Anyways, we have a lady notochord and we don't know why. But, you know, she might be an extraterrestrial. That's I don't know. I still don't know why they called her the lady notochord. Rumpelstiltskin always called her the lady notochord. And her sister is the lady Barbaro. Hmm. Anyways, it just might be just something for you to consider, the reptilian idea, a little bit further. Because again and again, the proof that I'm going to give you is that David R. Hawkins of Consciousness Research, is um, he co-wrote a book, Orthomolecular Biology, and the other author was Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling won the Nobel Prize. So David R. Hawkins is, you know, no fly-by-night snake oil salesman. He co-wrote a book with the guy who, who won the Nobel Prize. So, okay, that's two times just so. You don't say it's bullshit. It ain't bullshit. That guy is endorsed by the Nobel Prize winner. Does it get any better than that? So he said, there are devils in hell that are older. As individuals, those devils are older 
than our human species. So in all that time, don't you think that they've had a lot of time to develop a um, high tech in their dimensions so that they can actually go beyond their dimension and become trans-dimensional entities? That's a lot of time. You know, and once they evolve into, you know, velociraptors that, you know, have got telepathy with one another, I don't want to tell you that we're fucked, but, you know, we're quite fucked. Because they got a huge lead on us technologically, and, you know, there's the stuff, their the knowledge base is unbelievably big compared to ours. The reptilians, because they were here before us. A long zil I don't know how long a zillion is, but a long, I don't know. I don't know how many. You have to go and look back and let your, you know, on the... Blah, 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 fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. So, is there any advantage then in being in a, in a human body compared to reptilian? Well, it would probably be the brain. Well, the only thing would be, you know, could we be more spiritually advanced than reptilian races? Because I read that this morning, somebody said that's the only the only chance we have is that we're more advanced spiritually because they beat us on every other category, the reptilians. Every other category of a civilization, they beat us. Except one thing. We're more spiritually astute. Because reptilians perhaps are stuck in the limbic system, fight or flight all the time, and we're not, question mark. We all know humans always fly off the handle, and some humans have got a very, very quick temper, and they get angry for no reason at all, like really, you shouldn't be angry, you should be happy. You know, some people, it's like you hand them a check for $50,000 and they get really angry at you. But they explode in anger and they want to kill you because you just gifted them with whatever it was. And sane people, they're real. Everybody knows that there are. Yes, yes, we know. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But don't you think that there could have been some reptilians that did, you know, become spiritually astute in their limited abilities that they had? Even today. But, you know, maybe some of them just, you know, on a wing and a prayer and... Yeah, I don't know. It was like, you know, like breaking the two-minute mile. You know, like Sebastian Coe. I don't know. When was it? 1960 or something? When he was the first person to break the record of two minutes to run a mile? And then they said many more people were able to break the two-minute mile barrier after he'd broken it and before it seemed impossible. Him breaking the barrier seemed to make it easier for other people to visualize breaking the two-minute barrier or just do it because they saw him do it. What else sports psychologists say? But all you need is one person to show that it can be done. And all you need, who's that person? Well, it's going to be somebody who has a what? A burning desire. When everybody else said, man cannot fly, Orville and Wilbur Wright said, fuck off. So, so it's quite likely that in the reptilian races, that there were people like that because, just remember, that's kind of like the form that you take. Do you think that reptilians are incapable of producing like a William Shakespeare of their own? Because they never evolved as, well, I don't know. I don't know. Because if there's, you know, evil versions of those reptilian souls that are, 
in hell or in another world or in another dimension or they're right here but they're you know i don't know hiding somehow with camouflage because we did see an alien versus predator and we all know that you know the chameleon is a reptile they're so cute i mean i don't think you should be afraid of reptiles just because they're reptiles i can't tell you how cute those little chameleons are they're just so cute, you know, they're the size of your finger, and they're just so cute, they look up at you, and you're just so cute, you just love them. Anyways. I'm just showing you that you can, the general population, and the general population has got an enormous phobia and fear about snakes, yes. But turtles... Well, a snapping turtle, you know, but if it's not a snapping turtle, I don't know if it's a painted turtle and it's just there in the sunshine. On a rock by, you know, by a creek or something. Don't you want to stop and look at the reptile? And look at it and see, you know, if its head is going to look at you, is it going to look at you with its reptile eyes? Aren't you just going to love that turtle? You know, if you're, I don't know, six years old... You're going to be so excited. It's a real turtle. It's a real turtle. I saw one in the book the other day, and there it is. It's a real one. And it's not a snapping turtle. It's not going to bite me. It just looks up at me, and I look at him with wonder and amazement, and it looks up at me with wonder and amazement because I'm a six-year-old kid. And we all know that the reptiles evolved into birds. Many people have bird friends, don't they? Pirates always had a parrot. And the parrot wasn't caged. It wasn't. It was a pirate ship, and that bird was a bird. It didn't have its wings clipped either. Because sometimes they say that's what they did, but no, not real pirates. Real pirates didn't even capture the bird or train the bird. Real pirates? That bird came to those pirates to be a pirate's bird. Because it's like, you know, it's something to be if you're a parrot. To be the parrot that, you know, rides around on the shoulder of a real pirate captain. You know, the best, the best parrots... They know money, and they know real money. Gold doubloons, pieces of eight. What's a piece of eight? It's you take a gold, well, some kind of a gold coin, a great big Spanish gold coin from South America, Peru maybe, Incan gold from Inca. And then what they would do was, well, it was like a lot of gold, they, you know, they're buying whatever they're buying. Well, they just, you know, cut the, the gold coin into smaller pieces because they didn't want to give a whole piece of gold for, you know, a loaf of bread or something. So they give, you know, all a piece of it. Like, well, they cut it into eighths, and a piece of eight is an eighth of a gold coin. Pieces of eight. So that's what the, the pirate bird wants to do, is like pieces of eight and gold doubloons. And there's one thing that, you know, pirate parrots love and insist on coffee black coffee the parrot wants black absolutely it does what no no sugar no 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 what if you put you know some like rum in it black coffee with rum i think the parrot would drink it i think it would i think it would just like the other pirates because it loves coffee black coffee that parrot insists on black coffee, and you put some rum in it. I don't know. I don't think it's going to do anything but smile. But all the same, it's going to insist on black coffee. I don't know. Parrots know how to talk. And a parrot that flies around, you know, can fly right up to the crow's nest. Way up there, and it can perch way up there at the top with the tallest beam. And come back and report what it saw. Now, if you go up further north, you know, in your, you know, sailing ship, your tall ship, you leave the Caribbean, you know, and you go far north, I don't know, you go up to New York, well, you don't want to leave your parrot, you know, outside 
in New York in the winter. I don't know, because sometimes those, you know, seafaring people have got a landlubber's house, you know, that's where they keep the wife and the family. Well, that bird, once it gets in the house, I don't know, it's a pretty big bird. It needs an aviary. It needs an enormous warehouse that's going to be like, you know, glassed in. A galleria. So it's just, you know, maybe stained glass, but it's going to be glassed in. And then the sun's going to shine in and there's going to be trees, indoor trees in there. Because the bird wants lots of room to fly around. It's got exercise. You know, the size of, I don't know, the Mall of America or something. A huge aviary for the parrot. Because... In northern climates, you know, where it's snowy, those birds have got to have a place to live, and it's the Mall of America or something. Have I given you enough? Joel S. Goldsmith is the sermon of the day. Don't forget, Joel S. Goldsmith. You can pick anything that you can find. I give it a good listen, and uh, the one that we want to tell you was the final thing that we listened to today was um, just the Jesus' teachings. We were reminded of some of them that we'd forgotten. Those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Because Joel S. Goldsmith was talking about putting um, padres in the military. And he says it's stupid. Because those who live by the sword shall die by the sword, and there's no Christ in it. It's people who are putting their faith in material goods, a sword, a binnacle. It's a navy thing. Goldsmith said these things are like to, things to be enjoyed. What? The material things to be in there to be enjoyed, but not to put any faith that these things do anything for you. These things are the effect that you can enjoy. The cause, well, multiple causes. But in the end, you know, if you put your faith in all kinds of material things, Goldsmith says it's not gonna help you out. I don't know. You have to listen to the lecture. Well, uh, we'll uh, here in the comments or whatever, you know, the little blurb about what this description of what this is, uh, I'll put the Goldsmith lecture for you. The one that I was listening to about those who live by the sword shall die. But there's lots more in there. It's very good. So like I said, get yourself a nice place to just camp out on the couch and put on Dr. Goldsmith and listen to him chemicalize your brain. Because he uses the term chemicalizing. What's chemicalizing? Chemicalizing a term that came from before Joel Goldsmith. Joel Goldsmith is like, you know, a 1950s kind of person, 1950s, 1960s kind of person. Chemicalizing comes from long before that. Probably before he was born, 1895. Mary Baker Eddy. She, I think, invented the, the, the term chemicalization. What's chemicalization? It's the spiritualization of you. You go from being a physical, material man to becoming spiritualized. Because that's what Mary Baker Eddy said in 19, 1895. People think that we live in a material world. And she said that's the number one error. Error, error. She said we live in a spiritual universe. And everything in her book, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures, is all about changing your um, understanding of our reality here in my room or out there, out the window in the snow. She wants you to come to an understanding that it's spiritual, and then she, maybe she's going to explain to you in Science and Health with Keys to the Scriptures 
What exactly does it mean when she says it's spiritual, not material? Because other than that, because if you don't know what spiritual is in her eyes, and you don't understand what material is in her eyes, but how are you going to chemicalize and spiritualize? What's the advantage of spiritualizing yourself? Uh, well, you're an error. According to Mary Baker Eddy and Joel S. Goldsmith. Why are we talking about Joel S. Goldsmith and Mary Baker Eddy? Because they are famous healing ministries. And so we're doing book reviews and, you know, lecture reviews for you in this talk. Now you're going to want to know, well, why should I bother? Well, if you're in here at 36 minutes in, then you've you got a lot of curiosity. And I'm sure that's good enough. And if you were forced to get this far in my lecture because you put it on and then you, you know fell asleep on the couch, then I guess my voice is in your subconscious forever and forever and forever, reminding you. My name is Bobby Burroughs, and I wear a T-shirt that says peace. It also says, like, Brazil and Bahia and this other thing up here. It's just that I got this shirt at Value Village, and um, and it's just that I've never been to Brazil. I've never been to South America. You know, I don't know. I I just I don't know. I live in North America. The t-shirt says South America. I'm really far north in North America. I'm at the northern end of Highway 61 Revisited, the famous album by Bob Hibbing, Minnesota. Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, yeah. I'm at the northern end of it. Of Highway 61. That's where I live. The northern end of Highway 61. The southern end of Highway 61 is New Orleans. Now that's deep, deep, deep in the south. You know... The only way you go deeper and deeper in the South, well, I don't know, you got to go into South America, you know, right here. Now, I know, you mean, you can drive, can't you? Yes, you can. You can drive all the way to the end of the end of the end in the Pampas. At the southernmost part of South America. It's just that, you know, to go further north, well, you can't go any further north on Highway 61. Now, there are a few other roads that will take you further north. But they're, you know, taking you to, you know, very small villages kind of places, you know. I'm the last northern city. You know, like there's northern cities. There's Minneapolis, St. Paul. That's a northern city. And then there's Duluth, Minnesota. That's a northern city. And then you cross the border into Canada. And then there's the northern city of northern cities. Thunder Bay. On the north 
northwest shore of Lake Superior. The coldest of the Great Lakes. The biggest. Big cold Lake Superior. To go further north, like the next northern community, I don't know. You can either take the road to Armstrong, and it goes way, 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 way up there to a little community that's like so far up there. I've never driven up there. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. I can't even tell you how far it is up there. It goes along and along and along. And Armstrong is on the Northern Railway. There's a railway way up north, north of Thunder Bay. Yes, there is. Why did they put that there? No one understands. It is there. And other than that, then you got to go either use a winter road or you got to fly up to northern, northern indigenous communities. And then there's the Hudson Bay. So Thunder Bay is the last city going north. Highway 61, you know, you're in New Orleans and you're going north. Thunder Bay is the last northern city. And then beyond that, there's no more cities. And that's where I am. I'm north. North is north, and that's where I am. I'm Mr. North. And even my name says what it is here. My name is Burroughs. Because it's Burr cold around here in the north. Hello everybody, my name is John Snow. And you know, this is, you know, Brazil isn't the, the, as far south as you can get in South America, but it's still, compared to, you know, New Orleans, it's like deep, 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 deep south. So... I'm in the north, and the t-shirt talks about deep, 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 deep south. So, you know, what am I doing? I'm holding um, the Americas, let's just say. Oh, me, Bobby Burroughs, what are you holding it for? It's called, well, I don't know, I'm holding it because I'm here. I don't know. That's the way that it keeps coming out in words. I'm holding it. I'm holding North and South America. For whom? There's only one person I work for. It's God. I'm holding North and South America for God. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm... That's what I am. I'm North, and this is South, and we're holding the Americas for God. With the Infinite Way and Joel S. Goldsmith and Christian Science with Mary Baker Reddy. But forget Bob Dylan's album. You can play it off the internet. Highway 61 Revisited. And don't forget, Bob Dylan does talk about the other very famous place on Highway 61, the Crossroads. You know the song by Cream? Crossroads? That's the story of Robert Johnson meeting the devil, making the deal with the devil. That is on a crossroads of Highway 61. Yes, it is. There are many tales of Highway 61. Yes? No? I don't know. Listen to the record. <laughs>